presentarles al profesor Jean Emanuel Pesquín. Buenos días. Bien, este, él este, pues nos, eh, nos visita en la UNAM, él viene de Francia, él estudió su grado de, este, de físico, eh, de ingeniería física y microelectrónica este, en la Escuela Nacional eh, Superior eh, de Física de Grenoble, eh, por allá por los del 93, asimismo su, su maestría en, en óptica electromagnética y óptica electrónica. Eh, y terminó su doctorado en el año del 97 con una tesis en el área de guías de onda eh, amplificadas y dopadas con nervio. Esto fue eh, en el Instituto Politécnico de Grenoble, eh, donde ha trabajado este, pues en estas áreas de microelectrónica, eh, microfluídica. Actualmente es profesor en el Instituto de Grenoble de Tecnología. Este, obtuvo el, de, su full profesor en 2007 y bueno, realiza ahí toda una serie de investigaciones eh, en el Instituto de Microelectrónica, Electromagnetismo, eh, Electromagnetismo y Fotónica eh, del cual es actualmente el director entonces este, pues tiene una larga experiencia en estas temáticas y hoy va a compartir con nosotros los pues, resultados de sus investigaciones que ha realizado en años este, recientes y no tan recientes. ¿no? Sí. Sí. Recent years are not so recent. Entonces le cedo la palabra al doctor aquí, por favor. Ah, gracias. Buenos días a todos. Um, es un gran honor de estar aquí con ustedes. Pues no puedo hablar mucho español. Las únicas palabras que yo conozco en español son palabras de pulqueria, pues no puedo hacer ciencia en español. So I will switch to English. Okay, uh, so uh, my talk uh, will be entitled Glass Integrated Optics, and I will talk from um, things that we did concerning telecom, and then we'll uh, switch uh, to sensors. And Uh, before we start, I will I just present the place I come from. Maybe you'll be interested in a little bit of geography. So we said Grenoble. Where is Grenoble? It's actually in the southeast of France. I have big news for you. France is not only Paris. There's a lot of things. And in France, there are many mountains. Actually, most of the Alps, or the surface of the Alps, are in France. So I am from that city that is in the center of the Alps with all the mountains, you see the cable car, the cable car in the city. So population is roughly half a million people. Uh, it's not so big if you compare it with Mexico City. Uh, but what is interesting is that there are more than 60,000 students and 15,000 researchers, which means that Grenoble is the second biggest university and research center after Paris in France. Okay, something that will interest uh, the students, the nearest ski center is only 15 minutes from the lab, and the climbing site, the closest one, is five minutes from the lab. It's even bigger than <coughs> Strasbourg? Yes. 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 It's quite big. We have a lot of European facilities. We have St. Protons and things like that uh, in the city. So, What is the IMEDLAC, which stands for Institute for Microelectronic Electromagnetism and Photonics? Uh, we are actually 160 people on two sides, one in the Microtechnology Center in Grenoble, and the other one uh, 70 uh, kilometers away, uh, close to a beautiful lake. Uh, so we are on these two sides, and we are dealing with research fields in photonics, optoelectronic, terahertz, all these research fields uh, ranging from materials to uh, circuits and systems, but our majors are microtechnology and devices. This is where we do uh, most of our work. So to do this, uh, uh, and with this we have applications and we are making devices for all these applications. And To do this, we need facilities. So we have six technical platforms dealing with uh, microelectronics. So you can see how we can characterize devices. This is, um, let's say, a proverb that we use to characterize 
uh, devices at uh, helium temperature, 4K. Uh, these are probers for uh, 300 millimeters microelectronic wafers. This is atomic frost microscope and so on. Uh, we can do some high frequency and radio frequency measurements. You have a night, we have a big anechoic chamber to characterize antennas. Um, we do things in photonics uh, where we do integrated optic characterization and I'll go deeper into that uh, later. And we have our own clean room and our own uh, technology uh, facilities. And we have also things to do uh, Tiber Hertz and uh, femtosecond lasers and so on. Of course, computing, because without computers you don't know any, anything today. So, uh, this is this was the short presentation uh, of the lab that Celia asked me to do. So now I can go back to what I really like to talk about, uh, which is integrated optics. So I will first uh, talk uh, about the technology we are using, then I will present some passive devices, then active one, and see some things that we can do uh, in the future. So what is integrated optics? Actually, there are two ways you can see, you can use to see integrated optics. Uh, the first one is that you have bulk optics, they are big, they are hard to align, they are expensive, and you start reducing the dimensions. So you create micro optics, this is what you have in your cell phone, for example. And then you can just put and make one step forward and say, okay, instead of having several small elements, we will put everything on one single wafer. In that case, you will have devices that are self-aligned, that can be integrated, and that can be produ uh, produced uh, using microelectronic light uh, manufacturers. The other approach it comes from telecom. We have electronics, we want to increase the bandwidth, so we switch to microwave, and then we switch to uh, optical frequency, 140 kilohertz. So, uh, the two approaches are actually leading to the same kind of devices, the same technologies. So, today, integrated optics, there are several ways of doing integrated optic devices. You can either use thin film that you deposit on a substrate, or you can use uh, techniques based on a, dop uh, a localized doping of the material. So these are 35 SOI uh, dot silica on uh, silicon, and these are the kind of device you can do with them. And there is also glass that we will uh, focus on today, and like a nail bit that is mainly dedicated to modulators. Excuse me, ion diffusion uh, would be in the, in the case of doping based devices? Yeah. Okay. We'll see that later. So let's talk about glass integrated optics. So, glass integrated optics is based on ion exchange. So, what is the principle? Ion exchange has been used actually for centuries. It was used to change the color of the glass or to just strengthen the glass. So, if you take some glass, you have a silica matrix, and then you have some impurities in it, mainly alkali ions like uh, sodium or potassium. These alkali, alkali ions are weakly bounded to the matrix. So if you hit the glass, they can move freely in the matrix. So if they can move, you can replace them by, by other ions. For example, silver ions. And doing so, you change the glass composition. If you change the glass composition, you change its refractive index. The variation of the refractive index you create depends on the concentration of the element you put in. So, starting from that principle, we set a full uh, technology line, uh, starting from the substrate elaboration, then we do the photolithography to determine uh, where we want the ion exchange to occur. We do the ion exchange, then we dice the device, we do the pigtailing and the, the packaging. So, saying it differently, uh, what is the main difference between a silicon like SOI waveguide and an ion exchange one? So, silicon photonics, you will have waveguides that are made by a silicon layer that is quite thin, and you make a submicronic waveguide roughly 300 nanometer. So it is highly confined, you can have really sharp bend, 
and you can integrate that with CMOS uh, because it is made, made on the same production line. On the opposite, if you deal with ion exchange, you will have a glass, you will create waveguides that are a little bit bigger, they are circular, and they are highly compatible with fibers. So you don't use the same technology depending on the applications. Uh, the, app the technology we are using is based um, on glass, so it's based and it is intended to be highly compatible with optical fiber and presenting very low losses. So, how do we realize the waveguides in detail? We start from a glass on which we deposit a mask. This mask won't allow the ion to go through it. So then we create, by photography in the clean room, uh, apertures in the mask. We just put and plunge this wafer inside, uh, on inside of molten salt, where the ion exchange occurs. After it is done, you will create the core of the waveguide that is on the surface. But we can also um, add an extra step and put the wafer back into another molten salt to put back some sodium ions and apply an electric field and then we can bury uh, the waveguide, creating almost all the types of shape we want. So this is uh, the kind of shape we can have. Um, with this, we, we started making passive devices. So uh, these are typical uh, characteristics of the waveguide. So the losses are quite low, 0.05 dB per centimeter. And they are made by silver sodium ion exchange that is buried at 10 micron. So of course with this we did elementary functions. So this is the first uh, device ever made. It was in 1988 and it's a 1 to 8 splitter. We'll talk about that later. And of course with all these simple functions we moved to a more uh, complicated ones. And these are some last results where we do some 3D integration. So we have one layer with waveguides that are compatible with optical fiber that is buried at 22 micron and on the surface we create sub-micronic waveguide to be compatible with silicon photonic waveguide so we can make several layers today so these were uh, elementary functions and the development we did concerning technology we also started working on microsystems so this is the, one of the first microsystems we did which was a uh, double microsystem interferometer integrated on a chip. Uh, you see, it's really small and it was in 1999, if I remember well, and now it is commercialized and we'll talk about that uh, later. So, uh, let's talk about the evolution of the technology. So the first device in 1988, you see, it makes a beautiful picture, but it means that the device is really bad. Because you can see a light. If the light goes towards uh, the camera, it means that it is scattered, so it is lost. So this is something that we do quite often. When we want to do beautiful pictures, we keep the bad devices. And I don't know if you do the same in your labs, but in my labs, there is a photography uh, contest that we do with the bad <laughs> devices. So uh, it's quite cool for the students. Because if you feel depressed because your device doesn't work, at least you can make a beautiful picture. <laughs> so, uh, this was the first device. So, it was uh, operating um, at uh, red wavelength. It was multi mode and it had a lot of propagation losses. And after a lot of work, this is the device that is today on the market. So, you see, it is fully packaged. The coupling losses are very low. The insertion losses are also very low because uh, it's 1 to 8 splitter, so you have 9 dB of function losses. So there's less when there's only 1 dB of losses, and it has been qualified uh, for uh, telecom applications. So uh, we move from this to this, creating a spin off company of the lab, which is Team Photonics. So, what is the interest of using? integrated optics with respect to fiber optic. Let's do a 1 to 8 fiber optic device. Uh, we'll start using a 3db coupler. So it is based on interference, so you will have that problem of uniformity. <coughs> Although there is C and L band. And if you do so, when you start cascading 
uh, the splitter together one to eight. This is the inner homogeneity you get on the different uh, channel. If you use integrated devices, you don't have any interferences. You will use wide junctions that are based on the splitting of the wave front, so you don't have any interferences, which means that the response is really homogeneous on all the channel. It's so homogeneous that you see here a little uh, just bump in the losses. It is the water peak absorption that you can see because the losses are so low. You can see even the water uh, peak absorption. So this is the main interest. The other interest is that you don't have to cascade devices with fibers that are uh, spliced. So you don't have uh, a lot of risk of failure. So it's more stable and more reliable. This is why actually one of the market of these devices are uh, submarines. They are installed into submarines because they are highly reliable. And so let's move from telecom to sensors. So uh, with the technology, we started by making movement sensors. So uh, in 90, uh, 96, 1997, I was doing my PhD at that moment, and the guy in front of me was doing this. It was a double Michelson interferometer. As I said, so it allowed measuring movement with a resolution of 15 nanometer at a distance of uh, 7, 10 meter. So it was quite good at that moment because if you have some, uh, let's say, bad memories of setting a Michelson interferometer, I just tell you that it is self-aligned, so it's plug and play. And because it worked, we've been contacted by the European Space Agency to create the same device but to put it in, into the Ariane rocket, the European uh, uh, launcher, because it was intended to um, position satellites. So it has been specialized. It was a quite funny process where you try to break your device actually, and when it resists you're quite happy. And then from this we moved to a pick and move sensor, so um, the same device but optimized with a resolution of more than, or less than 10 picometer, and this is actually installed in France uh, by um, Earth uh, Security to sense for earthquake. So these are the devices that we use to sense an earthquake in France. Of course, we don't have as many earthquakes as you do here. Here, you don't need any sensors. You can, you can feel it. <laughs> In France, sometimes you hear in the news that the, the, the earth moved a little bit, but you don't feel it. So you need a very uh, accurate uh, sensor. Um, another application that we have for integrated optics that is quite uh, funny, I've selected applications for you uh, that are, let's say, <coughs> typical. Uh, it was uh, astrophysics. So if you want to detect planets or to see farther, you need to increase the resolution. The resolution depends on the diameter of the telescope. So you can't increase it infinitely because it will collapse or you will have too much defect. Uh, an idea that has been brought out by Michelson, still that guy, it was in 1870, if I remember well, was to make actually interferences between two telescopes. And in that case, uh, the resolution is not linked to the diameter of each telescope, but to the baseline, that is the distance between the two telescopes. So of course you can separate them by a long distance and you get better resolution. So this was implemented in the European uh, Southern Observatory Telescope called the DRTI in Chile, in Mont Paranal. And this is the recombiner, the recombiner table that was used with bulk optics. So you see it was quite big, a few square meter. There were more than 250 alignments to set. And the stability was not so long. You had only a few minutes to take pictures. And this has been replaced by, by this device. And this device uh, was self-aligned. It worked almost instantaneously and it's still used today uh, in Mont Pernod. So it's a good uh, proof of, of concept. It's the proof that you can do fantastic stuff. And uh, today, this device is almost obsolete because there have been devices that have been made uh, which allows recombining more than four telescopes. So uh, you see, it's really efficient. 
And another application that we can have to integrated optics is when you combine integrated optics and microfluidic. So it's really funny, and it's an idea we had uh, actually with a friend of mine uh, working at uh, McGill University, and so you know him. So he's a very nice guy, and then we were having one of two drinks in a bar in Montreal, and then we had an idea saying, okay, let's combine microfluidics and integrated optics on glass. Um, so we did it. These are microfluidic channels that I allow doing um, hydrodynamic focusing, and then after that we can do some sorting function. And the idea was to put one exciting waveguide here and two collecting waveguides to see uh, and to sense for uh, different particles. So these are uh, the first test, and it was really funny because we started with uh, microscope slides, and when we just launched uh, blue light, the glass started fluorescing by itself. So of course it was the first test, and it was not uh, so efficient and so good, but it was a beautiful picture. And this is what we observed on the video we did. So can I? Yes. So the, the, the wave guide that is here, what you, hear, what you see here is uh, the, chime, the channel. So you see that the microsphere that have been um, uh, treated to, uh, let, let's say, do some fluorescence. So when they go through the wave guide, they are starting um, emitting light. So they can go fast, they, it's, they can go one way, they can go the other one. So it worked quite well. So except that it made a funny movie, uh, it wasn't something that was intended to do some practical applications. Practical applications, they just arise when you, we were contacted by uh, people uh, dealing with devices operating in a harsh environment. So um, we just uh, did some, for example, photo ter photo thermal uh, sensor. So the idea was to create a microchannel and make a young interferometer and then measure the phase shift created by the absorption of, um, of an element. And with this, we make that sensor that is quite small uh, with the volume that is only of 3 nanoliter of solution. And you have the calibration curve. And it allows measuring things. Uh, for example, we measured cobalt uh, and uh, other elements into um, alcohol. So it was a good uh, device, but not so impressive. So we went further, and we've been contacted by the nuclear French agency, and because they wanted us to develop uh, sensors for nuclear safety. Because if you look at Chile, at the world, there are a lot of reactors around the world, more than 100 uh, in North America, about 60 in France, 16 today in China, but more than 200. So whether you like it or not, nuclear. But, but the number of nuclear uh, stations in Europe is decreasing, actually. Yes, that's what I'm saying. But whether you like it or not, they are here, and you have to deal with the used fuel, which is the main problem we have today. So, if you look at the nuclear fuel, uh, it's mainly uranium, uh, 238 and 235. And after three years, reactions stop because you create roughly 6% uh, of fission products that are not so good and that block the reaction. So, if you want to keep on using your, your, um, your fuel, you have to remove these. And the problem is that this is the cycle for the uranium, so you use it in the reactor, but then you have the spent fuel that is here, and you have to reprocess it. And so you have to put things out of one plant to put it in another one, and then to do some uh, chemistry to see what happens. And what people do fear, actually, is that they are afraid that some people might get some of the byproducts here and use them to make what they call dirty bomb. If you take radioactive elements and you put them into a water plant of a city, it's really dangerous. So the idea is that we need to remove all that 
movement here and to do the analysis using small devices in line inside the plant. So there are no elements that are going out <coughs> of the plant. Because today there are more than 55 kilometers of network of pneumatic tubes sending uh, radioactive elements. So it's not so good. So the idea, what we propose, it's the principle, is to have a micro channel here with an input fluid uh, output and then an optical channel and we will just measure the absorption due uh, to plutonium and see uh, the concentration. So we made a first test. You see it's really a proof of concept, something you can do in the lab. And we designed a waveguide in such a way that the, there is a huge interaction between the waveguide that is here and the nanochannel that is here. Okay? The channel here is only 100 nanometer thick, so it's really small. So we reduce the volume. So uh, the proof of concept uh, was done, but then we had to go to nuclear plants. So what you have to know is that uh, when you are uh, using uh, nuclear fuel reprocessing, they are dissolved into nitric acid with a concentration of 8 mole. Just so, something. pH 2 is 10 to the minus 2 mole. So you have negative pH actually. Okay? So uh, it's really, really a, a, um, a strong acid. So we have to use a glass that is really strong, which is borosilicate. And then, of course, they are ionizing radioactive elements, so we can't use any glue, any plastic, anything. We have to create anything. And, of course, uh, we have to use it in a glove box or in an armored cabinet, because we are not allowed to kill students or technicians. I don't know how it is in Mexico, but in France we are not allowed to do that. So uh, we need a departed sensor with pigtail fibers. So, uh, we developed a technology for reali realizing microfluidic channel without uh, any glue. So, we did some process flow, etching some grooves inside the glass, and then we did some molecular width of bonding. So, molecular width of bonding is based on a van der Waals for, uh, force adherence, and then you, you make some uh, annealing and treatment to create covalent bond between the two wafers. You see the result at the end, you don't see any difference between the two glass wafers. You recreated actually a homogeneous material. And this is uh, the groove that we created. This is the chip. This is the first microfluidic chip uh, interconnected that was tested. So uh, once we have the technology, we did some uh, microfluidic calification. So this is fluorescent, so you can see the green stuff. Uh, these are the capillaries injecting uh, liquid. Uh, this is the part where we will sense with a volume of 21 microliters the connectors. You can see the, here the microfluidic axis, and you can see the typical uh, behavior of microfluidic, microfluidic channels uh, with uh, that tensile forces uh, on the boundaries. And once we did this, we went into nuclear environment, so things were installed inside that glove box and all uh, the optical part uh, for like the source or the monochromator, they were outside the, blood, bo the box, excuse me. And these are the devices we provided with three devices that were fully packaged. And with this, uh, plutonium was measured, you can see here in inset the calibration uh, line as a function of the, uh, the calibration curve, excuse me, as a function of the concentration. And you see the absorptivity that has been measured uh, with our device. So it is in red. And in uh, black, you have the reference uh, that uh, we measured with uh, commercial equipment. So we have good values, except here and here, where we have to improve slightly uh, the noise of the measurement. However, uh, we obtain this curve with only 21 microliters. So it's quite good. So I've finished uh, with basic devices. Let's move to active devices. 
So, um, to do active devices, actually, we will use also waveguides, but we'll do them in a phosphate glass instead of a silicate one. Because phosphate glass can be docked. And we dock them with a rare earth, namely neodymium, if we want to make pulse laser, or erbium, if we want to uh, make classical laser or amplifiers. So we have propagation losses that are also quite low. And we are still using silver sodium ion exchange, but we bury them not so uh, deep, only at 5 micron. And we can achieve gain between 1 to 3 dB per centimeter with erbium. So this is the image of an actual uh, Erbium dot waveguide amplifier that you can buy. You can see that there are several <coughs> electronics and here you have the passive devices uh, chip and here the active chip. So what is the active chip? <coughs> Actually it's here, So and you see this evolution. On each chip here there is a 90 centimeter long waveguide that is wrapped. So uh, you see that we started from quite a big device and we managed to improve the technology to get to a device that is very small, very integrated and that you can put in a butterfly. So uh, this is quite uh, something that was interesting in terms of optical amplifiers. Or other optical amplifiers you are still competing with uh, erbium, erbium fiber amplifiers that are not so bad in terms of performances, but are, that are quite not expensive. So and you need to provide with more added value, and this is where the idea of making lasers uh, arises. So uh, you can make uh, lasers. You can do some classic laser with that are fabric period. So the first uh, proof. Uh, was made by Kitagawa in Japan in 1991. Then you can make DBR laser, it was done by DZ. So you replace one of the mirror by a bright reflector. And you can do some distributed feedback laser on glass, which was done in my lab by my first PhD student, that was Silva Blades. So with this, we can integrate several lasers on the chip, and we actually integrated 15 lasers on the same chip and we selected the wavelength in such a way that all the wavelengths are put on the ITU grid. So each wavelength corresponds to one channel of uh, telecommunication for uh, WTM transmission. You have wavelengths spaced uh, by 100 uh, gigahertz and some that are spaced here, the smallest, by uh, only 25 gigahertz. So it was quite good result in terms of telecom, and we were quite happy with it. But unfortunately, at that moment in 2003, there was no market for that. So that beautiful result and that beautiful device would have been left on the shelf if we didn't find a solution. And actually, the solution came when another PhD student of mine started working on these lasers and made measurements are about uh, the line width of the laser. And the line width of this laser is below 3 kilohertz. So it's very stable and it has a very low relative intensity noise. So thanks to this, you can use this for sensors. And this is actually what has been done. And we have been contacted by uh, major um, operators in, let's say, um, Airplanes, so Airbus, Thales, and Dassault, and because they needed to develop LiDAR for airplane. Because today, if you want a plane to fly, you have to control the speed with respect not to the ground, which you can do quite easily with the GPS, but with the air. And to do this, you, you will use pitot gauges. The problem with pitot gauges is that there are many tubes. And if you live in a tropical country, if you go in Yucatan, for example, there are bees who are making their nest here, so they won't work anymore. If you are living in countries where there are storms, what happens when you go through a nice storm is this. So you lose the gauges. So to keep the plane flying, they have to put a lot of gauges, hoping that 
some of them at least would resist. Another option is to create something that is not outside the plane, that is inside the plane and that can sense um, the, the speed from the inside. And this is why the Nestle uh, consortium has been made. So we were here and there is Team Photonics also. And the idea, whoops, I missed some uh, things here. I don't know why. And I missed a lot, a lot of things actually. Uh, okay, so, so the idea is that you just launch a, a laser, it goes outside and then it is reflected back. Of course, since there is a relative movement between the plane and the dust particle, there is a speed and a Doppler effect. So this, what you should see here is a schematic of a classical uh, heterodyne setup. We, get, we launch uh, the light, we get the light back, we make some mixing of it, and we measure the frequency difference. So uh, the first uh, the first test was in 1998 by Sextar Avionic, who became a Thales. And it was made with a CO2 laser. It's a big machine that was really heavy. And of course, you can't use that into a commercial flight. Mainly also because you were using CO2 laser, uh, emitting a few watts. So imagine you do this, you create actually a weapon because you will kill almost everybody who, who would be in front of the laser. So. Uh, I don't know what happened. It worked uh, 10 minutes before. So uh, maybe I will try something. That is just. was not the right one. It says that my. Here it's working. It's working now? Now it's working. It says to me that there is not enough memory. It's the beauty of Microsoft. <laughs> So while uh, this uh, starts, I can show you uh, what we see when you are on the top of Europe. This picture has been taken from the Mont Blanc, which is the highest summit of Europe, that is only one hour and a half away from Grenoble. So it's not so bad. This is called the Aiguille Verte. Uh, for Four thousand and two hundred meters. Eight. You can climb it. Yes. Yeah, it's it's in Chamonix, so it's well known for climbing. And it doesn't. Did it? Does it work? I, I will do it. It should work now. got my picture back. Okay. This is why I have a Macintosh. Unfortunately, I have to use some Microsoft product. Don't say that on YouTube. <laughs> okay, so uh, this was the first test and uh, it, it was too big for commercial flights. So uh, we started trying to integrate. So during Nestle, what we did is that we just tried to integrate things and we provided with that laser that was so small, which was actually an evolution of the DFB uh, uh, laser made by my student. All the other parts were uh, classical fiber optic devices. And with this, you see, we put anything on a single girl rack. And it worked. It has been tested in the air. And this is uh, the, what we obtain when we compare uh, the true airspeed measured by pitot gauges and the one measured by the leader. It's almost perfect. Okay, there is just one point here that was not good. But except that, all the measurements were uh, uh, the same. So it was okay for one axis, but if you want to place your plane, you need three axes. So you need to increase uh, the integration. So we started with just one function integrated. And then there was another project that started that was called Daniela. And the idea was to integrate all the functions. Of course, since we are dealing with airplane safety, uh, people are quite conservative and you have to improve step by step. So 
although everything was integrated, the idea was to uh, link every function by fiber. So if there's a problem, you can change it to stay function by function. So with this, this is what happened, and it was possible to integrate two optical channels. And these two channels uh, have been used on the plane, and they are being qualified flying during 60 hours and more than 30,000 kilometers from North Pole to Equator. So uh, it's a device that works really well. Whether if you look at it, this is the optical part, you look at the integrated photonic block, and you see that it is quite empty. Uh, if you look at the useful surface, it's quite small, but this surface is quite big. Why? It's because of the optical fibers. These fibers, uh, you can't bend them sharply, so they take some room. So if you want to go further into integration, you have to remove the fiber. And this was something that just structured the research of my group for quite a long time, because we took function by function, and we worked on integrating them. So first of all, we worked on the integration of the optical isolator. So we had to do a polarization splitter that was integrated. So it was the PhD of François Barcy. And then we had to do some Faraday rotator, integrated a magneto-optical layer. And it was the PhD that we did in collaboration with the University of Saint-Étienne and with uh, Jean-Philippe Garret. And then we integrated uh, the pump. We had to hybridize the pump. So it was the PhD of Thomas Nappé. The duplexer for pump signal multiplexing, that was the PhD of uh, Lydie Onesta, uh, and so on. We had to integrate the amplifier. The, it was the PhD of um, Florent Gardiou, uh, who is now working at Team Field Photonics. And finally, we integrated laser monetically <coughs> using uh, 3D vertical integration, and it was the PhD of Marco Casoli. So you see, that for a simple devices, there were one, two, three, four, five, six PhD. It's not easy making integrated devices. When it works, at the end, it, it looks obvious, but it takes a lot of time to develop. And I want to finish with this by uh, presenting a project that unfortunately didn't stop. But I've been involved in it for quite a long time, there were two projects that were called Integrated Optic for Darwin 1 and 2, and the idea was an idea, an idea that was uh, just proposed by the European Space Agency to do the VLTI, but to do it in space. So, to launch six telescopes, <coughs> imagine six Hubble telescopes, and then recombine them into a central hub. So they wanted us to develop the technology to uh, create the integrated optical circuit that will recombine the beam from the six telescopes that are freely flying into space. Of course, uh, doing this would have been too easy if they were asking us to operate in classical wavelength. Actually, they asked us to make devices that were operating between 6 micron and 20 micron. So in the middle for it. Why? Because the idea was to detect life. And if you need to detect life, you need to detect biotraces. Methane, CO2, and things like that. <coughs> Mainly methane. So you have to be in this range where there are absorptions peak. And uh, we, which was funny is that we started from scratch, so uh, we were wondering which technology to use, and we took the problem by two hands, and we said, okay, 20 micron, it's almost microwave. So we did mic microwave-like waveguide. This is a uh, metallic color waveguide, so you see this is 5 by 10 micron, and this is gold everywhere. So it's a classical uh, metallic waveguide, like the one you use for radar, of course they are quite bigger, and we also developed a new um, materials based on calcogenide to go further in wavelength. Both solutions allowed uh, obtaining wave guiding, and we were quite happy, but unfortunately, 
uh, what happened is what happens quite often with a space project. Uh, they said, well, the results are fantastic, but we don't have money for the moment, and the project has been delayed. And when they say that they delay the project, it means that I will probably more not see. I will probably not see uh, the project or the telescope flying one day in my life. Maybe my grandson will. Okay. So um, I hope I haven't been too long. I hope I didn't bother you. I will now finish and summarize. I presented you one of the technologies that can be used to do some uh, integrated optic devices. That is ion exchange on glass. It allows making low loss and high quality waveguides and we can realize with them passive and active devices. Uh, as passive devices, we can do devices for telecom, but we can do also uh, devices for microsystems, and we did actually microsystems, and these microsystems are interesting because they are suitable for harsh environment, because glass is really stable. We can also do uh, active devices that are based on ramp up the um, amplifiers and lasers and they allow making CW and pulse lasers. I didn't uh, speak about uh, pulse laser because I don't have enough time. And uh, there are many applications like terahertz generation, me medical diagnosis and so on and so on and so on. I thank you again for your attention and if you have any questions, I'll be pleased to try to answer them. Thank you very much. Si alguien tiene alguna pregunta, podemos intentar traducirla. We can translate the question. If yeah. Uh, when you were talking about the ion exchange in glass, you talk about the Michelson interferometer. Yeah. And you said you uh, you reached picometer resolution. Yeah. How did you manage to do that? Because with double quadrature, you can get uh, tens of nanometers. Yeah. So, where's the magic? Or? Oh, this is a question that is asked quite often. Okay, uh, it's a matter of uh, what they call um, resolution. It's, how can I say that? It's a problem of metrology. I'm not a specialist of that. But it's not the fact that you will measure some picometer exactly, but the fact that the real lab reliability of things like that are better than a picometer, if I'm right. Mm. Okay? Uh, this is what they call accuracy. Mm. Uh, because picometer, it's so small, it's almost uh, the, the, the size of an atom, so you can get it, uh, let's say, absolutely. It's a quantum measure. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Uh, have you tried to fabricate something uh, using semiconductors and glass devices as well? Yes. Yeah. We did some. Actually, I didn't uh, nah, have the time to talk about it, and Celia told me that I should <coughs> remove some slides because I had much more. And instead of talking about time, present the lab, which I did quite fast. And you won't punish me? I did yeah. it. <laughs> because I was afraid that if I didn't uh, present the lab, I would sleep in the street tonight. So, uh, actually, uh, we have projects with uh, ST Microelectronics uh, where we hybridize, we do some 3D integration of um, silicon photonics chip and glass chip. Because glass is really good as an optical interposer. It's good for having basic function. It's good for coupling, coupling with optical fiber. So it's very interesting. Moreover, uh, in my craft today, uh, what they do is that they are using more and more glass because glass is a good substrate for microwave. There are no losses <coughs> while you do have some in, in silicon. So the idea was to use the best of both worlds and to put some microwave functions and optical function on glass and then to move from the glass into the silicon photonic chip where we do some other active functions where there are all the photodetectors and where there are the free fives that have been also hybridized and we take the best of both worlds yes, we do this 
But if you want me to make a presentation on that, I need 45 minutes only for this. Okay. So another question? I have two questions. Uh, the first one is um, why there is no a lot of uh, functions in glass of, uh, integrated optics that can be bought as the fiber applications, fiber optic applications. They can be bought. Yes. But no, you can buy them. But there are not so many, so many companies. What you, what actually happened is that. In 1995, the internet bubble started. So everybody thought that you will need a lot of optical devices. And there were many companies dealing, dealing with this, doing a lot of things. And then around 2000, that bubble exploded. So uh, a lot of companies uh, did, um, did actually die. Uh, Team Photonics didn't, because we managed to create sensors. But, uh, the problem was at that time that the technology we had, the devices we were able to do, were actually too good for the need of the market. Okay, uh, we make devices. We've been making devices since uh, 1995 that can transmit, uh, let's say, 50 gigabits of data. Who needs that in your house? Because if you need integrated optics, it's when you go to the home. It's not for means for um, for backbone telecom, where on the backbone you will use fiber. So it's when you go and you need to integrate several functions. So it took time for the market to catch for the need of the market to catch what we can do. And today, one of the major market that we have in terms of integrated optics are the data center. It's in the data center where there are a lot of interconnect <coughs> and a huge density of data stream that you need integrated optics. Not for the backbone. For the backbone, you're, you're just having a submarine cable. You have a lot of place in the, in the sea, you know? Okay. The second one is, uh, in which application are, are you working in that moment? Or are you interested in working? Oh, so what we are doing now, uh, we are, it depends if you're talking about me, if you're talking about my group, or if you're talking, talking about my institute. Because I have several cap. Yes. <laughs> the three of them. Oh, well, as an institute, so 160 people. We are working on devices, of course, and ranging from microelectronic to photonic. And applications used to be mainly focused on, let's say, data, transmission, the Moore law, and things like that. Today, there are, we have a lot of change. We are dealing with more diverse stuff, like sensors, like uh, health application, like biology. We're making biological sensors. This is why we, we started working on um, microphysics and so on. As for my group, uh, we are still working on glass integrated optics and making a strong support to Team Photonics, for example. Um, and other startups, but we are also working a, a lot with a silicon photonics guy to develop the silicon photonics. So we have these two activities. And as for me personally, uh, being the director of an institute of 160 people, uh, my research are mainly focused on the optimization of Excel functions. <laughs> To, in order to do administrative work <laughs> as fast as possible. <laughs> it's not politically correct to say that, but I think that the professors that are in the room know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Did I answer? Yeah. You took too long for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's not any question? Other question? No? Then we no. thanks, uh, Professor.